Good morning. Welcome to GCF Northeast online service. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Today we celebrate the Lord's Supper and I hope that you have already prepared the table elements so that you can participate in our celebration later after my preaching. At kung matatandaan niyo rin po ay nabanggit ko nung simula ng pag-aaral po natin ng chapter 10 ay magkakaroon po tayo ng series break. Subalit sa hindi inaasahang pagkakataon, uh, ako po ay hindi nakapag-preach for three consecutive Sundays. Uh, sa tingin ko po ay yun na ang ating series break. Sapagkat ang ating mga preachers ay nagsalita po sila on different, different topics. So next Sunday ay sisimulan po natin ang pag-aaral sa chapter 11. At ngayon tatapusin po natin ang chapter 10, the last 13 verses. Marami po nagsasabi, that Jesus is the most controversial person in history. Do you agree? Both history and mankind are divided over Jesus. Typically, we date historical events based on whether or not they occurred B.C. before Christ or A.D. Anno Domini or the year of our Lord, or after Christ. Not only that Jesus divides history, but also mankind. And he said that he would do so. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 37, it reads, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be the members of his household. The one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. At ito po ay alam natin na nangyari at nangyayari pa rin hanggang ngayon sa mga bansa kung saan ito po ay sarado or pinagbabawal ang Biblia, ang salita ng Diyos at paghahayag ng mabuting balita. Marami pong mga Christians or mga naging Kristiyano, sila po ay pinatay, sila po ay na nalagay sa panganib ang kanilang buhay. So ito po ay talagang nangyayari. But we also know that the Christian faith rests entirely on the right answer to the question of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ asks you that question, Who do you say that I am? How are you going to respond? Now, if Jesus is the promised Messiah of Israel, and he is the eternal Son of God in human flesh, sent from heaven to earth by the Father, who died on the cross in place of sinners, who was raised bodily from the dead, and who will come again in power and glory to judge the living and the dead, then everything else is secondary. There may be difficulties in the Bible that you cannot solve, but these difficulties are just secondary. You may struggle with a hard question like, why did it happen to him or her? Why do little children suffer and die? Why do some people never have the chance to hear the gospel? But those questions are secondary. You may struggle with doubts, because of personal trials or unanswered prayers. But these struggles do not undermine the truth of Christianity. If Jesus is who he claimed to be and who the Bible claims him to be, then our entire Christian faith stands. But if he is not who he claimed to be, then our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ would be in vain. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they say 
that, uh, or they hold Jesus in high esteem. They even say that they believe in Jesus, but they deny His true, uh, His true deity. Many people say or think that Jesus is a great example, a model, a teacher, but they do not affirm that He is the Son of God. And perhaps you've heard of liberal professors and theologians who say that Jesus never ever claimed to be the Son of God. Well, I hope that you'll mark this in your Bible. Highlight this in your Bible apps. Because here, here in our passage, we see that Jesus clearly quotes himself claiming to be the Son of God. It is in a passage in verse 36, it reads, Are you saying of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blasphemy because I said, I am the Son of God. Before we continue, let's read our text found in John chapter 10, verses 30 to 42. And I'm reading from the Nasbi. Please follow along as I read the passage. Verse 30, I and the Father are one. The Jews pick up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied to them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, We are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are God's. If we call them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be nullified, are you saying of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to arrest him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he stayed there. Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Verse 42, and many believe in him there. All people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Our gracious loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we thank you for your word. We pray, O oh God, that you open the eyes of our hearts to the ministry of the Holy Spirit that will able to be able to understand and comprehend your word and be able to apply this in our lives. Thank you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we talked about eternal security and what a word, a marvelous word of assurance that we see in verses, in the first half of verse 28 and 29. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. If you have placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then your place in heaven is eternally secure. Jesus has given us eternal life and that life is protected and kept and guarded by two unconquerable beings. Yes, brothers and sisters in Christ, no one, not even we ourselves, can take us out of the Father's hand. But we must also remember, tandaan po natin yung larawan na binigay ng Panginoong Jesus tungkol sa kanyang kawan, tungkol sa tupa ng kanyang kawan. In verse 27, it says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. So how can we tell a true believer from a false one? 
from uh, one who just professes his faith. First, he says, my sheep listen to my voice. The true believer is drawn to what Jesus has to say. He longs to hear the word. He wants to know more. And so he reads, he studies, he meditates, he ponders on the truth and comes regularly to hear the word of God. My, he, my, my sheep hear my voice. Are you part of his sheepfold? And then the second one, the second description, he says, I know them. When the sheep read the word of God, they have a sense of welcome from the Lord himself. They know that this word of deliverance, this word of healing applies to them. They feel they are accepted. They could sense that they belong. They feel the Father's arms around them. And they could sense the Father's heart beating for them, for their cares and their concerns. They know that there is a personal relationship established. They have become the children of God. This is what Jesus means when he says, I know them. And one of the marks, again, of true believers is that they always have this sense of belongingness, that they belong to God, that they are part of the family, that they are children of God, and they uh, have a sense of being welcomed by the Lord himself. Are you, again, a member of the sheepfold? And the last description is that they follow me. That is, they obey Jesus. They do what he commands. This does not mean that they always do so instantaneously, that they obey. Agad, agad. No. Without struggle. No, there are times that we struggle, right? With what the Lord has to say. Or what, with what the Lord says. And so we resist Him. And sometimes the Word of God needs to be brought sharply and clearly into focus in our lives. And when that happens, when we are focused and we know what Jesus wants us to do, the attitude then changes. And we say, Lord, even if it hurts, even if it costs me, I will follow you. We don't follow the world. We follow the Lord and these, are, these two are going in opposite directions. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters in Christ, when the choice is made, the choice is in favor of obeying the Lord Jesus. And so if you listen to Him, and He knows you intimately, and you follow Him, then you are part of the fold. You are eternally secure. No one, not even you yourself, can take you out of His hand because the Father is greater than all. We are kept, guarded, protected by the sovereign power and love of God. Yes, we may struggle. We may hurt. There will be times of deep, dark depression and times of doubt and despair. But we will never perish if we are part of the flock. And so in our passage, it begins with I and the Father are one. Now, we must remember that the Jews wanted a plain, a plain answer on whether he was the Christ or not. Diba? Nagpapag-usapan natin last Sunday. Wala nang figures of speech. Sabihin mo, ikaw ba si Kristo? And Jesus did not answer them that he was the Christ. In fact, he gave far more. He said, he and the Father are one. Well, some say, some skeptics say that uh, uh, this statement by Jesus here it means that he is united with the Father to, uh, in, in their purpose and action. To protect the sheep from the enemy. But we must remember in verse 28, Jesus says, I give you eternal life. And then he claims that he's able to protect the sheep from all predators. Unto eternity. And that is a claim to deity. Sinasabi ng Panginoon na siya ay Diyos. And following this proclamation, because the Jews understood what he said. In verse 31, the Jews pick up stones. Again, to stone him. Now, tandaan po natin, sila po ay nasa templo. Di po ba? Ando doon sila, naglalakad doon sa colonnade of Solomon. At wala pong mga bato doon. So they have to go to the courtyard. 
Doon sila kukuha ng mga bato at ito pong bato ay hindi itong maliliit lang na bato na kayang hawakan ng isang kamay. Ito po ay dalawang kamay nilang hahawakan. At habang sila po ay nagpipik ng mga stones, tinawag sila ng Panginoon. Jesus called them out and, and asked in verse 32, He said, I showed you many good works from the Father for which of them are you stoning me? It's like Jesus telling them, Are you mad at me because I healed the centurion's son? Are you mad at me because I displayed zeal for the house of the Lord? Are you stoning me because I healed the man at the Bethesda pool who was disabled for 38 years? Are you mad at me because I walk on water to help the disciples in the midst of the storm? Are you mad at me because I gave sight to the blind man na hindi pa nangyayari sa kasaysayan ng mundo? Ako ba ay inyong babatuin sapagkat pinakain ko mahigit labing lima o dalampung libong tao, gutom na mga tao doon sa wilderness? Are you stoning me because I cleansed lepers and raised the dead and healed the sick? Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was asking them, ano sa aking mga ginawa? Ang mali, yan yung gusto akong batuhin. So how are they going to respond to that evidence? Because not a single action performed by the Lord Jesus gives validation to their unbelief. Wala ni isang ginawa ang Panginoon, himala na ginawa ang Panginoon na magpapatunay na ito ang dahilan kaya sila ay hindi naniniwala sa Kanya. Because they are all good works from the Father. At ang mga Hudyos sumagot in verse 33, We are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself out to be God. You see, nobody ever stoned anyone for doing a good work, the law made no provision for that. And so they are saying, here's the point, we are stoning you because of what you said that you and the Father are one. That means you are claiming to be God. And that is blasphemy. Ipinapantay mo ang iyong sarili sa Diyos. Gayong tao ka lamang. You know what they're saying? They're saying that Jesus is guilty of robbing God of the honor that is due Him by claiming or making Himself God. But what is crazy is that their accusation, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the opposite of what was actually true. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, Who has He already existed in the form of God? did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bond servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. So the reality is that Jesus is God. And he took on the form of man. But they're claiming that Jesus is man who is claiming to be God. Nakita niyo po yung kabaliktaran. Nakita niyo po yung deception. And we must remember that the gospel was preached in the context of opposition. So much opposition during their time and until today. There were many religions and beliefs. And people believe in many gods and lords. There were many mystery religions. There were also Roman and Greek divinities. And some of the names of these gods and goddesses were in the pages of the New Testament, such as Artemis and Zeus and Hermes. The city of Athens was filled with idols, even an altar to the unknown god. And in Acts chapter 19, it says that the new believers practiced magic arts before they came to know the Lord. 
And not only there were many different religions and practices, some people tried to change the message of the gospel to make it conform to their own ideas of what was better. Time and time again, we read warnings in the New Testament about people denying the truth about Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul warns us in Acts 20, 30, And from among your own selves will, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And then Apostle Peter warns us about false teachers. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, the first half, But false prophets also appeared among the people just, as there will also be false teachers among you. Jesus himself warns us many times about false teachers and false prophets. You know, there are many Jesuses out there. For example, the Mormon Jesus. For them, Jesus was the first spirit to be born in heaven. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus has always existed with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 of that chapter, in chapter 1, and the Word became flesh. And we know that is Jesus Christ. And another error from the Mormons, they say that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. And we were all born as siblings in heaven to them both. But we see, but we know that the Bible teaches that God, that Jesus is God, an, an uncreated being. He is not a created being. And Lucifer is a fallen angel, a created being. The Jehovah's Witness, Jesus, the Watchtower, Bible and Tract Society teaches, among other things, there is only one God, one person whom we call the Father, and whom they called Jehovah. His first creation was a being named Michael, the archangel. And when it was time for the Messiah to be born, Michael became human. And he was named Jesus. You see? Twisted. So much deception. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our problem is that we do not take this warning seriously. And we may even think that these false teachers and false prophets are not here in Novaliches, not here in uh, Greater Lagro. That they are perhaps in the uh, barrios or perhaps not in our country. But the truth is they are all around us. They preach another Jesus who is not the same Jesus that we find in the Bible. They preach another message of the gospel and not the message of the gospel that we find in the Bible. Brothers and sisters in Christ, they may be on TV, they may be walking on the streets of Quezon City. The scriptures warns, warn us to be careful, to be vigilant, to be diligent, to study the word of God so as not to be deceived. And so Jesus responds to his accusers in an unexpected and unusual way. And he answers them in the form of a question. In verse 34, he quotes Psalm 82, verse 6. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are gods. Now, Jesus is going to use a form of logic called reasoning from greater to less or from major to minor. And the focus of Jesus' argument is going to be on one book of the Bible, one chapter of that book, one verse of that chapter, and a word within that verse. And the word is God's. You know, verse 6, Psalm chapter 82, verse 6, and John chapter 10, verse 34, are used by cultists and false teachers and false prophets to teach the little God's doctrine. Na tayo daw po na naniniwala kay Jesus ay maliliit na Diyos. Eric Paul, a televangelist, says, Adam and Eve were placed in the world as the seed of expression of God. Just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. Saan niya nakuha yun? Kenneth Copeland, a prosperity gospel teacher, says, You don't have a God in you. You are one. 
Jesus is no longer the only begotten Son of God. Again, saan niya kinuha yun? Now, this false teaching is now available to us on TV, on different forms of media. Do not be deceived. The scriptures are clear. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 35 and 39, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is no other besides Him. Verse 39, Therefore know today and take it to your heart that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. And after quoting that verse, Jesus presents His argument in verses 35-36, saying, If He called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be nullified, are you saying of Him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, this is a claim that no mere man can make Ni, hindi po po pwede na isang tao lang ang pwedeng umangkin nito. Na sinasabi niya, I was sent of God. I came from God. I existed with God. I was one with God. Di po ba? Ito po ay isang claim ng isang Diyos. At marahil nung narinig po ito ng mga Hudyo, ng mga religious leaders, talaga sila po ay nam sila po ay nagulat. Naglakihan ng kanilang mga mata. Parang tayo nasabihan, o oh, mayroong magsabi sa inyo, ako ay Diyos. Ako ay anak ng Diyos. Ako ay nabuhay. Dalawang taon, ahead of you. Di po ba? Maniniwala ka ba doon? And so we see in this verse, my friends, Jesus' confidence in the inerrancy, the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. And He is saying two things are certain here. The psalm, calls them gods. The book of Psalms called them, calls them gods. And then, the scriptures cannot be nullified, cannot be broken. Ang Panginoong Jesus, itinaya niya ang kanyang buhay. Remember, nakaamba na sa kanya yung mga Hudyo, babatuhin siya. Dahil nilapastangan niya, sabi nila, ang pangalan ng Diyos. At siya umasa, doon sa isang salita lamang, doon sa scripture, gods, you know, down through the centuries, many ungodly people tried to refute and destroy the Word of God. But they all have failed. And one example is the famous philosopher Voltaire. He held up a copy of the Bible and he boasted that he would put it in the morgue. Before long, he was in the morgue. And his house was used by the Geneva Bible Society as a Bible warehouse. In Psalm 82, what did the psalmist mean when he used the phrase, you are gods? Who was he referring to? Now, he's talking about the judges and rulers who ruled or judged the people of Israel. And they are called gods. They are called gods because they represent God to judge and rule the nation of Israel. It was God who put them in their positions of leadership. Now, in Exodus chapter 7, 1, another example, God said to Moses, See, I have made you a god to Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 6, as well as Exodus chapter 22, verses 8, 9, and 28, the word translated judges is the Hebrew word Elohim, which literally means God's small g. And here is Jesus' conclusion. He is saying to his accusers, Bakit niyo ako kailangan batuhin? Dahil ginamit ko yung salitang Diyos? Eh, yung mga tao nga eh. Sila na nanungkulan bilang hukom ng Diyos. Ginamit nila, tinawag nila mga sarili nila, mga Diyos, ako pa. I was anointed, sent by God, sent by the Father from earth, from heaven to earth, and do His work. Ngayon, ginamit ko ang salitang Diyos that I am the Son of God, 
babatuhin niyo ako dahil nilapas tanga ng ko ang pangalan ng Diyos? And after hearing those words, the Jews, the leaders, started to relax their grip. At akin pong ma in envision tinitingnan marahil na unti-unti nilang binababa yung mga bato na hawak nila they have lost the argument and the crowd that has gathered around them knows it and because of that Jesus said in verses 37 to 38 if i do not do the works of my father do not believe me but if i do them even though you do not believe me Believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Now, the term works in John refers to all that Jesus did to promote the Father's purpose, but often specifically to the miracles that He did. So all that Jesus did, so all, so all that Jesus said, especially the miracles that He did, Confirm that He is God in human flesh. Kaya wag po kayo magtataka na marami pong mga skeptics, mga nagdududa, mga liberal theologians, ay inaatake nila itong mga himala na nakikita sa Biblia. Kanila pong sinasab- pina- uh, bubulaanan na ito po ay hindi totoo. Sapagkat kung sila ay nagsabi na ito ay totoo, inaamin nila na si Jesus ay Diyos. But I also believe that there are a few who if they believe in the works of Jesus, it wouldn't be long before they would come to believe and put their trust in Jesus. This was the case of one of the most well-known illusionists or magicians in the world. His name was Andre Cole. Andre Cole was an atheist. He was skeptical of Christianity. At siya po'y nahamon na kanyang imbestigahan itong mga himala doon sa Biblia, lalo na ang mga himala na ginawa ng ating Panginoong Yesus upang patunayan at sabihin na ito si Yesus ay isang peke. At itong mga, itong, itong mga himala ay mga ilusyon lamang, magic lamang, mga magic tricks. Subalit sa kanyang pag-aaral at pag-iimbestiga, ang naging result, the opposite. Siya po ay nakumbinsi na ito pong mga ginawa ng Panginoong Jesus na mga himala ay totoo. And so Andre became a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and also a public speaker of the Campus Crusade of Christ. Campus Crusade for Christ. And he used his abilities as a means of presenting the gospel to thousands of people all over the world. And so when Jesus said, verses 37 to 38, what was the result? It says in verse 39, Therefore they were seeking again to arrest him, and he eluded their grasp. Anong naging resulta? Now, pansin ninyo, so ang sisimula sa verse 31, gusto nilang batuhin ang Panginoon. Pero dito sa verse 39, gusto na lang nilang dakpin, arrestuhin. Ang Panginoon. Di po ba may pagkakaiba sapagkat sabi ko kanina nga, binabana nila yung kanilang mga dalang mga bato. And now, the Jews want to take him. Gusto nilang dakpin ang Panginoong Isus at doon sila magplano kung anong gagawin nila. Next, subalit sila po ay nabigo muli sapagkat si Jesus and His disciples, they escaped. In verse 40, And He went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he stayed there. Ito pong lugar na sinasabi po ni Apostle John kung saan nagpunta ang Panginoon was about 30 kilometers away from Jerusalem. Maring matatanong natin, bakit doon siya nagpunta? At meron po mga iba't ibang mga rason na ibinigay. No? Sabi nila, it was a place of safety sapagkat malayo na ito, 30 kilometers, at hindi na siya susundan ng mga religious leaders. Sabi nila, din nila, it was a, a special place for Jesus. We must remember that his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion were just a week away. And so he returned to this place because this was his launching pad. He started his ministry here and he was baptized 
by John the Baptist here, where John the Baptist proclaimed that he was the Messiah. At, at ito po si John the Baptist, kanyang inudyukan, hinimok ang kanyang mga tagasunod na sundin ang Panginoong Jesus. But poss possibly the main reason that Jesus went there was in verses 41 and 42. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believe in him there. Now these people must have listened, listened to John the Baptist while he was preaching and baptizing in their neighborhood. And maybe some of them were baptized by John the Baptist. No, ito po mga tao na nandu doon na sinasabi sa verses 41 and 42, kanila pong narinig ang paghahayag ni John the Baptist at maari ilan sa kanila po ay nabautismuhan ni John the Baptist. At tandaan po natin sa panahon sa, sa event na ito, tatlong taon na ang nakakalipas ng napugutan ng ulo si John the Baptist. Subalit naaalala pa nila ang mga sinabi ni John the Baptist tungkol sa Panginoong Yesus at kanila pong napatunayan na ito ay tututuo. And as a result, many still believe in Jesus. You see, John the Baptist did not perform any sign. He did not perform any miracle. But he spoke about Jesus in a way that these people wanted to find out more about Jesus. Do they want to find out if uh, what John said about Jesus was true? John the Baptist, hindi po siya dynamic speaker. He was not an eloquent speaker. But he spoke about Jesus in a way that people wanted to find out more about Jesus. And so Jesus found their faith genuine. They came to the realization that everything that John the Baptist said about Jesus was true. And so they placed their trust in Him, not only, of what, not only because of what He did, but because of who He is. My friends, kayo po ba ay nasa kawan ng ating Panginoon? Kayo po ba ay nakikinig sa kanyang salita? Kayo po ba ay kilala niya intimately? At sinusunod niyo ang Panginoon? If so, then you are eternally secure. Your place in heaven is secure. And even the most severe trial that you will experience cannot separate you from the love of God. It cannot separate you from the grip of God. But if you are not yet in the fold, would you please know Jesus, accept Him as Savior and Lord of your life, and also this event in Jesus' life tells us a lot about Jesus' view of the Scriptures. He held the Scriptures in the highest possible esteem. No one, had ever, no one has ever had a deeper, uh, deep reverence for God's Word than Himself. He read it. He studied it. He meditated on it. He pondered on it. He obeyed it. And he often shared it from memory. Jesus believed in the inspiration, the authority, the truthfulness of scriptures. And he came to fulfill the scriptures. My friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, what is your attitude toward God's word? Your attitude toward God's word is a reflection of your attitude toward Jesus. Because he is the main focus of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And now if you are not sure of your relationship to God and you are not familiar with the Bible, I challenge you to read the Bible and take a good look at what it says as Andre Cole did. Investigate the life of Jesus. His miracles, the prophecies he fulfilled, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven. Visit the Bible not as a tourist, but as an explorer. 
And there are two ways that you can study the Bible. You can study the Bible with your mind already made up. Or you can study the Bible and let it make up your mind. You see, if you're going to approach it in that way, the second approach, you will find every word of it to be true. You will find Jesus to be all that He claims to be. And your life will be changed when you turn it over to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Friends, there are gold and precious stones between the pages of the Bible. But you have to dig for it. And the deeper that you dig, the more spiritual riches are there to be found. And then obey them. Follow Jesus' example and share this wealth to others. Amen? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you especially for the eternal word, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And we pray that you would bless this word to our hearts. Bless us in our relationship to Jesus. And if there is anyone here this morning who's not a Christian, who's not yet in the fold, by the power of the Spirit, would you please give them no rest until they find that rest which is in you. Thank you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today is the second Sunday of the month, and as I've said a while ago, we observe the Lord's table. It is a worshipful bringing to mind of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. It is a dramatized proclamation of the gospel, a reaffirmation of our fellowship, and a victorious celebration that we're going to have a foretaste of that victorious celebration that we're going to have when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And so if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ for your salvation and submitted your life to His Lordship, you are welcome to partake of the table of the Lord. But let us also take heed of the warning of God's Word in 1 Corinthians 11:27. Therefore, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And at this juncture, I, I ask you to confess things that you have said and taught and did that are displeasing to God. Repent. I'll give you a minute. Our loving Father, we thank you that you have called us to be a people for your own self. And you have called us, Lord, to observe the Lord's table. And we know that you are with us today, that you are in each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to stay focused on the bread and wine and to think about these symbols, Lord the body and the blood, both poured out as a drink offering for a once and for all sacrifice. How wonderful are your ways and awesome are your blessings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the bread and wine and what these mean to us and what they tell us about our eternity. And so in the spirit of unity, we all now partake of the wine and the bread and give you the glory for your amazing grace. In Jesus' most beloved name, I pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also has passed on to you. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all partake of the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And for whenever you eat of this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us all partake of the cup. Let us pray, our loving Father. What a privilege again to be able to come before your throne of grace and partake of the precious sacraments of bread and wine in remembrance of your atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Lord, may we never forget the enormous price that was paid on our behalf. May we never forget that we have been bought, bought with the price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we live for him from this day on, knowing that your body was broken and your blood was spilled for me and for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.